Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Film and Philosophy, where love of wisdom meets love for film. We are your hosts, Bree, Angel, Pat, Basil, and Angela, and we're so glad to have you here. Look, I remember one time my dad took me to this jazz club, and that's the last place I wanted to be, but then I see this guy, and he's playing his chords with force on it. And then with a minor, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Then he has the inner voices. And it's like he's, it's like he's singing. And I swear the next thing I know, it, 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 it's like he floats off the stage. That guy was lost in the music. He was in it. And he took the rest of us with him. And I wanted to learn talk like that. That's when I knew I was born to play. Connie knows what I mean. Right, Connie? I'm 12. Today, we're going to talk about the movie Soul, a Pixar film released in 2020, directed by Pete Docter and Camp Powers. What did you guys think of the movie? I thought it had such an interesting concept for a children's film. I mean, especially since it directly addresses the idea of an afterlife. I really, really like how the animators imagined abstract concepts like souls and translated them into these characters with different personalities. I agree, and we're going to make it even more interesting by connecting it to Gabriel Marcel, our philosopher of the day and his definition of hope. Prepare for a fun-filled, philosophical, spoiler-filled episode. Today, we'll be exploring three key events from the movie. The first would be at the beginning, where we are introduced to the main character, Joe. He is fueled by his passion for jazz, and we learn about his dream of becoming a famous musician. As he struggles to get by and to live as a part-time middle school music teacher, he still believes that he will get his big break. The second event we'll be exploring happens later in the film, when things turn south for Joe. He gets into an accident right before his big break and finds himself in the great beyond, confused but eager to return to Earth. He's driven by his hope to get back to Earth in time to perform in his dream gig with Dorothea. Through the process, he meets 22, a soul that struggles to find passion. The last few sequences of events that we'll be exploring happen during Joe's return to Earth. After his experience with 22 and making it to his dream gig, we see a conflict that Joe faces. We'll look into how he finds a new sense of hope in his passion for jazz, one that acknowledges uncertainty but chooses to live his life. In Marcel's text entitled Sketch of a Phenomenology and the Metaphysics of Hope, we can determine that hope is being patient with the creative processes of life connecting to it and opening oneself to it. That might sound vague right now, but don't worry, we'll go through what that means together. The text has three main points that Soul's protagonist, Joe, also experiences. The first being what hope is not, the second as the middle ground, and finally, what hope is. Let's start with the first. Really, I'm not your teacher anymore. Oh, okay, Mr. Gardner. Hey. Look, I'm the new drummer in the Dorothea Williams Quartet, and we're kicking off our tour with the show at the Half Note tonight. Dorothea Williams? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Congratulations, man. Wow. I would die a happy man if I could perform with Dorothea Williams. Oh, well, this could be a lucky day. As seen from the clip, Joe Gardner was a man who had high hopes to pursue what he thought was to be his true passion, music. When presented with the opportunity to play with Dorothea Williams, lead singer of a famed jazz band in New York City, Joe went on great lengths to pursue this, as he believed it would kickstart his career. In this pursuit, however, it seems as though he was blinded by his own optimism. On the way to his audition, Joe literally missed a step, as he fell into a manhole crossing the street, missing his audition. His very own desire to reach such an outcome without considering any other possibilities led towards his journey in the great before. I think we can all agree that this is a really shocking start to this film, and it's a Pixar film nonetheless. But it really set up the film well and kept me intrigued. At the same time, what we can gather from here is the concept of false hope, which perhaps many of us fall victim to. Yeah, when I saw that scene, I wasn't sure how to react. 
I thought the carelessness was kind of absurd, but when I thought about it, I guess that was the point. He was so focused on achieving his dream of becoming a successful pianist that he didn't see anything else. He was blind to everything around him. It was what he believed to be the best course for his situation, so what could he do, right? In that sense, I got Joe, and now more than ever, I resonate with him. There has to be at least two times in a day where I'm complaining to my family or friends about losing all of senior year and having an online graduation on top of online classes. It's unbelievable to me. I never imagined that my college experience would turn out to be this way. In my mind, there's really only one way to have a great college experience. Physical classes, physical graduation, the full conventional ordeal. But that's not the reality we're living with. And to be honest, it's hard for me to accept anything else because I still believe that the traditional way is the best way. I'm still hoping that somehow we'll get to have some form of physical graduation, as shallow as that may sound. Right. I super, super relate. And I like how you use the word hope in that context. Because that's a thing with the understanding of hope we usually have. I hope that we have a physical graduation. I hope that I get to see my friends soon. I hope that I become a successful jazz pianist. Hope is reduced to having a wish supported by a certain belief. In Joe's case, I wish that I become a successful jazz pianist and I have probable cause to believe that this could become true because I am a great jazz pianist and I have an audition with Dorothea Williams. Marcel calls this the diluted condition of hope, and we'll go through why authentic hope is introduced to just this. The word hope is probably one of the most used in everyday conversation. It's common to hear someone say the phrase, I hope that, though if you notice the thing that follows is usually something trivial. For us right now, what hits hard is really, I hope that we get a semblance of normalcy for our last few months in Ateneo. Whether sports, academics, they're not unimportant or valueless things, of course, but they're also not usually grave situations. There's nothing to take to heart because the reasons for hoping are external. They're not rooted in our core selves or our humanness. Exactly, and I believe Marcel calls this the point of indifference, wherein hope is again reduced to a mere calculation of certain chances a person is considering or a practical problem of probabilities. We always find ourselves seeking for a specific outcome, reducing hope to a mere wish or blind desire. And if we don't meet these expectations we've set upon ourselves, it could inevitably lead to our own despair, a concept that we'll discuss more in detail later. So in Joe's case, He had already calculated the outcome he wanted for himself, and he had the desire to achieve success in his chosen industry, the probability of achieving which was high, considering his audition with Dorothea Williams. And though of course not valueless, this was something momentary or incidental. During his time on Earth, Joe Gardner was unhappy and dissatisfied. For many years, his stylist daydreams of becoming a famous jazz pianist weighed him down, preventing him from living life to the fullest. And this is what Marcel describes to be as captivity. Mm -hmm. So essentially, this concept can be summarized in the line flashed on screen. And it may sound a little complicated, so let's break that down. As humans, we often find ourselves in situations of distress, discomfort, or pain. Marcel terms this as darkness. It is here that we aggressively search for deliverance from our current situation and our I hope that is directed towards that salvation, or what he calls the light. I see where this can become problematic. Like what you said earlier, in actively trying to search for the light ourselves, our hope is directed towards what we ourselves think is the lightness, something that has yet to be born or to exist. Exactly. So in order to escape the dark situations we're in, we usually create or assume the right option for ourselves, which of course takes away from hope's real definition and in Marcel's words, makes us prisoners of an experience which tears our hearts. Hope is a mystery and not a problem, so we can't assume the answers to that mystery just because we're trying to find our way out of our darkness. If we did, our hope would be intertwined with a specific situation or outcome, but more on that later when we tackle optimism. Yeah, and I'd just like to go more in-depth to the concept of darkness. It's no doubt that we humans are subject to such captivity. Oftentimes, what we recognize as hope turns out to be a confusion of our own self-serving wishes and desires. Like what you said, 
we tend to wish for a specific outcome to occur. And if we don't attain such, it can lead to darkness, a state of despair. It can be difficult to break out of this state once we're facing it, as though we are truly trapped. Rather than living through our experience and seeing the light it may bring, we feel hopelessness and the impossibility of getting away from this situation. As Marcel discusses, finding oneself in captivity occurs when you're unable to open yourself to all possibilities, as though being held captive in darkness. And in order for hope to prevail, one must trust in the creative processes of life and open the soul to the realities presented. I definitely agree that just because we are easily susceptible to captivity, it doesn't mean there is no way to break free. If we take a look at Joe once again, he was a captive to his own darkness and a slave of his own desires. He didn't allow himself to open up his soul to other possibilities, nor value and live his experiences. His blindness to these literally led to his near death. But as we get to part 3, we'll see that hope can still thrive and the light can still manifest through these events. My life was meaningless. No, no, I will not accept this. Kid, give me that badge. I'm going back to my body. Oh, yeah, sure. So moving on to the next part of the film, Joe and the Afterlife. You could really see that Joe was more than reluctant to go to the great beyond upon his near death. Things were just beginning to turn out well, only for him to fall into a coma. Everything he'd been working for his entire life would essentially amount to nothing if he were to die just like that. Joe does just about everything he can in his power, to get back to Earth and to his body. He forces his way off the machine belt that carts souls off to the great beyond and lands in the great before for unborn souls instead. He then gets mistaken as one of the mentors for the unborn souls and subscribes to this false identity, essentially stealing it, just so he could get back to his body and live the life he'd been dreaming of since he was just a boy. As a mentor, Joe is tasked with aiding a certain soul named 22 in fulfilling her badge and finding her spark which would allow her to become alive as a human being and enter the earthly domain. One can imagine how such a role entails much responsibility, but for Joe, it served a more utilitarian purpose. Joe saw this as his ticket to another chance at life. I know I'd probably do the same if I were to die with a whole bunch of unfulfilled or unrealized dreams, even more so if things were just beginning to go well for me. So, in this segment of the film, we'll discuss more in-depth some key concepts we briefly mentioned earlier, these being ego and desire, optimism, and despair. Just to reiterate what Basil mentioned earlier, we commonly do have a misunderstanding of the definition of hope. What we mistake to be hope is usually a product of desire, fear, or egotism, or is rooted in the need for self-preservation, self-involvement, or self-centeredness. Let's go back to Joe. Joe's number one goal was to achieve recognition and success as a jazz pianist. He claimed his life's purpose was dedicated to music, but even as a music teacher, he was still unsatisfied. His hope then was rooted in his desire for fame and prosperity in the music industry, things that would satisfy his ego. So in a sense, you can say that I hope that can actually be and is often synonymous with I wish that. Exactly. Hope is reduced to a mere wish. So when he's comatose, he can't achieve this desire or fulfill his wish or I hope that. He's now in a situation of darkness and the ego didn't get what it wanted. So what does it do? He takes advantage of his accidental position of 22's mentor in order to fulfill her badge, get her spark, and return back to Earth. He believes he knows the best outcome for himself and doesn't trust in the creative processes of life. Right, and this is where we can see Joe's optimism. Now, when you look for definitions of the word, you'll find that most describe it as a state of being hopeful or expecting that the outcome of a situation will be favorable. Marcel's definition differs in that optimists don't just expect a favorable outcome. They create the outcome they believe is most favorable to them. When thrusted upon the darkness, we really don't know how our situations will be resolved because we're not all-knowing beings, right? But an optimist can't stand the anxiety that comes from uncertainty and has no faith in the creative processes of life. The optimist thinks that he has 20-20 vision so he knows what his light in the darkness will be, and he clings to it. But as Marcel says, 
hope is a mystery and not a problem. We can't calculate the most favorable outcome for ourselves because we don't have the 2020 all-knowing vision and we're not God. Right, so Joe wasn't able to fulfill his desire. He was in darkness and unable to accept the uncertainty of his life and inability to satisfy his ego. He tried to create a reality where the ego gets what it wanted, wherein he has a successful career as a jazz pianist. Speaking of, I think it's important to note Joe's conversation with one of the counselors, so let's just play that segment for a bit. You should probably get going to the great beyond. Hey, um, we never found out what 22's purpose was. Excuse me? You know, her uh, spark, her purpose. Was it music, biology, walking? <laughs> we don't assign purposes. Where did you get that idea? Because I have piano. It's what I was born to do. That's my spark. A spark isn't a soul's purpose. Oh, you mentors and your passions, your purposes, your meanings of life. So basic. No, no, it... It is music. My spark is music. I, I know it is. So it's clear that Joe was unable to accept anything other than what he believed to be true his entire life, which is his spark in music, his only purpose is to play, it's what he was meant and born to do. Note that he says, I know it is, as if he's an all-knowing being. To him, a spark is equivalent to a purpose or some sort of achievement. He refuses to believe that purposes aren't assigned or that sparks don't equate to purposes. They're indicators that the soul is ready to live. He even discredits 22's experience because he can't accept that those ordinary moments can amount to something as great as a spark, and he reduces the spark to a mere calculated purpose. I really loved how the counselor said, Oh, you mentors and your passions, your purposes, your meanings of life. So basic. Because you know the meaning of life and our purposes is like so basic. But it's funny because it's so contrasting with virtually every movie which puts a premium in finding the meaning of life and makes this out to be such a deep concept. Laughing aside though, it's true. When we set a purpose for ourselves and decide what the meaning of life is, we're reducing it to a trivial calculation or problem, disregarding that it's really a mystery. Again, how can we know when we're not divine beings? It really comes down to not opening our souls to the mystery of life and the possibilities that come with the unknown. Majority of the film's events revolve around something very Joe-centric. In the film, Joe does virtually anything and everything to get back to his body and relive the life that was so abruptly taken away from him. In many ways, Joe's actions are self-centered, self-preserving, and founded on the fear that his life will have amounted to nothing should his earthly life truly end where it did. He creates this false sense of security and certainty, where if he is successfully able to rejoin his body on Earth, he will finally be able to live the life he feels he deserves. For Joe, it was all about me, me, me. He found himself so deeply in a sphere of illusions that he experiences despair. Despair is the result of the false sense of security he creates for himself. That comes as shocking when this is revealed to be nothing but an illusion. For Joe, he felt as though his fate was completely in his own hands when the reality was that it wasn't. There are so many variables in life, and for one to think they can grasp and mold all of these variables to fit their own ideals is an illusion in itself. Yeah, I agree. It is clear that Joe actively struggled with this even after his time on Earth. In his unwillingness to let go of his desire, hope became conditional. He became so unhappy and dissatisfied with his own reality, despite dedicating his career to music as his mission. It was because he was closed off to any other possibility and rooted his hope in the ego that he was thrust into a state of despair and he was unable to achieve what he so aggressively clung to. To Joe, not being able to accomplish what he set his whole existence for made his life meaningless, despite the fact that his life was already full of music and rich with experience. Exactly, it's seeing his journey and his struggles to grow which make watching the third part of the film all the more worthwhile.
clip really has to be one of my favorites. I enjoyed seeing Joe's journey of growth towards acceptance, finally breaking away from his despair caused by blind desire. He literally just had to reflect in his life with a fresh pair of eyes, and in his case, a cat's eyes. Yeah, it was also interesting to see how his so-called passion did not give him the happiness he thought it would. Upon finally being able to play with Dorothea, he finally achieved his biggest lifelong dream. Despite this, he realized that he was left feeling unsatisfied, almost disappointed. What he did not expect in this journey alongside 22 was that his eyes would be open to his very own selfish desires, that his ego had directed him for the most part of his life. Particularly, he realized that he barely knew anything about the people surrounding his life, only being concerned by his own interests and desires. And having to navigate 22 in his own body really gave him an outsider look, as well as establish a meaningful relationship between the two characters. In this instance, the importance of communion, of togetherness, is highlighted. His overall experience led to acceptance, coming to terms with his misconceptions of life, and how he met the limit. He too was able to find his spark. Joe's experience has showed how from acknowledging the difficulties in life, his perspective transformed into one that was more hopeful despite uncertainty. Speaking of experience, Marcel too grew his discussion of hope through expanding on his own. Similarly to how to the story of Joe, his experience gave light to what hope meant. We see how their sense of hope grew through the challenges that called for new perspectives, one that acknowledges uncertainty and the existence of darkness, but still chooses to see possibilities. We now move into the discussion of acknowledging risk as part of the human condition and experience. It is essential to accept that risks exist, as denying this would deny hope. We look into an excerpt from Marcel. This tells how, as we experience risk, this is where we see opportunities of hope. We would not come across these opportunities or even recognize these without the risk and uncertainty that experiences bring. For more, we learn that hope is not conditional. There are no sole reasons for hoping that make this a calculable outcome. Uh, saying, I will remain hopeful because of blank makes it a transactional sense of hope where it depends on another concrete or calculable outcome. Going back to how Marcel had discussed the difference between I hope that and I hope, the latter does not call for a specific outcome. As nothing is made certain, hope does not rely on predictions. It remains open to possibilities despite its uncertainty. As mentioned earlier, communion remains to be a big part of attaining true hope. In Marcel's discussion, it is what makes hope possible as it allows for a break from darkness due to despair. As he stated, communion breaks the ego and opens self to the other. Furthermore, as Marcel highlights, we are also able to break away from our self-serving needs once a love is concerned. Such formed relationships allow for openness to ensue, as the weight of responsibility we feel for another is much greater than the darkness that consumes us at times. With this, we are called to transcend, away from despair and into facing the realities that life brings. Mm -hmm. And I think that this can really be seen in how Joe's formed relationship with 22 had freedom from his self-centered desires, away from his egotistical needs. In this experience, he began to pursue a more authentic relationship with the people surrounding his life. And from here on, he was able to discover his true passion and began to open himself to what life had to actually offer. We see that in the movie how they had depicted how strongly Joe's passion was for jazz. He believed his existence was defined through his passion, although upon meeting 22 and having the task to help 22 find passion. We see the challenges that allowed them to power through uncertainty in hopes of finding and fulfilling this. Passion relates to hope by often influencing the want for a specific outcome in life. In the case of Joe, it was getting his big break as a musician. This reveals his sense of hope as a certain outcome. One that depends on whether he gets to fulfill his passion or not. We see that this sense of hope is not true hope. Later into the movie, as he experiences more challenges, Joe's sense of hope evolves wherein his passion became a tool to appreciate life. After acknowledging uncertainty, he accepts this but still continues to live pursuing his passion, no longer associating his hopes and successes solely to being a famous musician. Eventually, Joe's passion became less about a certain outcome and more into living his life with his passion despite uncertainty. 
Whereas previously, he believed life was meant for fulfilling a purpose and in trying everything to do so was not actually living, he's now learned what a spark really means. By opening his soul to more realities, he learns the value of life and begins actually living it. He gets something greater than what he could have imagined by his own calculations. The segue is into what hope can truly be. Absolute hope is seen as a gift in the sense that it is a call to which we respond. Hope calls for trusting that uncertainty will exist, but knowing that darkness is not absolute, and that you remain open. With this, absolute hope interlinks strongly with absolute faith, wherein given the call of hope, we are still given the choice whether to respond with this. Having debunked hope as many of us know it to be, the question remains, what is true hope? It can be difficult to navigate its true meaning due to many misconceptions, but as Marcel discusses, true hope can be found under these factors. First, hope is humble. It's free from demands and thrives on uncertainty. As Marcel describes, it comes from something far greater and beyond us all. To attain such humility, we must acknowledge and accept the fact that we may never really truly know what lies ahead. Looking at this under the perspective of religion, it's never demanding from God, the great other beyond, for a specific outcome as though we are coming from an insider perspective, as though we are playing God ourselves. Second, hope is graceful. It requires grace in the sense that it is never forced. True hope allows for us to move past forward all situations, even the darkest. It allows for us to accept that there is something else that lies ahead, no matter how long it may take. This is why hope requires great patience. As we are not all knowing, the timing of our lives is never certain. All we can do is to trust in what's to come and in the creative processes of life. To keep patient, we must also be open to all possibilities as time unfolds. As life is full of uncertainty, hope allows for us to withstand all experiences, even the worst of such that seem impossible. In doing so, we continue to hope as we know that even in the darkness we face, it is not the end, as there is promise beyond. Hope requires us to be capable of self-giving. We must be able to fully give ourselves to trust the process, despite limitations out of our control. As Marcel describes, it is the ability to rise from one's fathom and to simply accept our uncertain destiny, which is why we are reminded that it is never certain as if we already know. Reflecting on these concepts, it really can be hard at first to see how we're able to take on these notions of hope on our own. All of these, can be found once again in Seoul, in Joe's journey and finding true hope. We don't need any reminder that our shared experience of the global pandemic is the darkness we're all living with today. With the state of the world, especially here in the Philippines, it's easy for us to get caught up in wishing for more favorable circumstances. I myself have been throwing my I hope that's back at the universe with the longing for the old normal. But if there's anything Marcel and Joe taught me, it's really that we don't know. We don't know how our current darknesses will be resolved, or even if they will be. Even with the vaccines and modern medicine, we're really not all-knowing beings. We can't predict the future, and we can't dictate what kind of future would be best for us. Though what we can do is trust, and I know it's so much easier said than done, especially with all the uncertainty we're living with, but we're really called to make our souls available to be open to the creative processes of life and the promise beyond our shared experience of this darkness. A fruitful life is one that trusts in doing the good in spite of uncertainty. The film Soul definitely is a concrete example of Marcel's definition of what hope is, what it isn't, as well as what the middle ground between the two is. In the first part of the film, all the effort Joe placed into becoming a jazz pianist finally amounts to something. Then. He has a near-death experience, placing him on a very thin line between actual death and life. Here, we see how hope is often misunderstood. You can also see how the point of indifference leads Joe to go through life with shallow desires. In the darkness of Joe's life, he creates his own light, when the reality is that we never really know what this light is going to be. There is no certainty. Joe also experiences the false definition of hope in the sense that his I hope that really is more of an I wish that. In the second part of the film, Joe enters what could be understood as the afterlife, which came in the form of the great beyond. An artistic articulation of what happens before people are born comes in the form of the great before. Here, Joe's false sense of what hope is, is shown to be rooted in ego and desire, fear, and self-centeredness, which leads him to 
feelings of despair since he gets so caught up in the false world of illusions he created for himself. His sheer optimism when it comes to what he was meant to be leads him to take his fate into his own hands. The last part of the film shows how Joe has an epiphany. With a new perspective on life, he begins to embrace its processes rather than trying to take it into his own hands, failing to notice the beauty life's processes can offer. The sequence of events in Joe's life, from when he finally landed a gig, to refusing to enter the great beyond, landing into the great before, to having a second chance at life and looking at it with a fresh perspective, he's opened him up to what hope truly means. He embraces that life is not totally in his control and that it never will be. As a result of his experiences while he was in the body of a cat and him spending time on Earth with 22, he opens himself to others and learns to live in communion with those around him. Ultimately, as he acknowledges the darkness and uncertainties around him, he becomes more open and lives his life with hope. What better way to end than with some wise words from Marcel himself? Hope is essentially the availability of a soul which has entered intimately enough into the experience of communion to accomplish in the teeth of will and knowledge the transcendent act, the act establishing the vital regeneration of which this experience affords both the pledge and the first fruits. Thanks for tuning in for this first episode of Film and Philosophy, where love of wisdom meets love for film. We are your hosts, Bree, Angel, Pat, Basil, and Angela, and we're wishing you a safe and jazzy day. Stay hopeful! Well? Thanks. So, what do you think you'll do? How are you going to spend your life? I'm not sure. I do know.